Um, and I'm going to open it right away to questions um, because we don't have much time. I was going to take privilege of being moderator to ask 25 of mine, but I'm going to open up first. Um, so if anyone has questions, please raise your hand and we'll bring you the mic. Okay, well, I'll kick it off then. Um, okay, so I'm tired. I'm really excited, but I'm tired. <laughs> um, there's a lot to learn. So one of my big questions um, is just about how, what tools do we use? There are a suite of tools um, to use in various parts of the, of the data generation, analysis, um, inference process. There's different ways to collaborate. Um, and it would be really useful if, especially in an interdisciplinary setting, we can kind of come to agree on, on what tools might be most useful and also look down the game tree about what might survive the next 10 or 15 years or what we might build on um, and what we should invest our time in. And I tend to be a pessimist. Um, so I, I, this comes from kind of three bottlenecks or potential concerns that I see. Um, and one is just what I already said, technological or application fatigue, um, just getting burnt out on always having to learn something new or something more advanced, um, especially when our time is limited. Secondly, um, we kind of have a legacy problem. Um, so we have incentives to work with more senior faculty um, that maybe are not exposed to these new uh, technologies or approaches, and either there's resistance or it's just a time problem. Um, so how do we manage moving the entire faculty forward and that's and over time um, and some of Tracy Tracy's work I think speaks to that a lot. How do we move everybody forward together? And then um, kind of thirdly as we adopt um, these new tools and norms in an interdisciplinary setting, um, you know, is that going to help us facilitate collaboration or might it actually uh, kind of pigeonhole each of the disciplines even further because we're speaking languages that don't communicate. So if we could just talk about those challenges to start. I would say uh, questions. I, yeah, I don't. I don't think <laughs> I know. Related to what 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 do we use? Um, if only. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say one thing I I didn't mention during the talk that I wanted to make sure to say was that. Um, Data storage, where you store your data and archive your data, is a, is a really big deal, right? You want to make sure that you're storing it somewhere that's going to be around and it's going to persist um, into the future. Um, so OSF has a, a large grant, a uh, an endowment, $250,000, to support the persistence of data, um, even if, for some reason, the OSF it itself ceases to exist. So I think as researchers are thinking about where to store their data, I'm sure the Dataverse has similar types of things, you know, so it's not, not just OSF. But I think it's important to think about the long-term life of, of the tools and so on that we're developing. Um, I would also say, I'll put in a plug for R. I use R in R Studio, and I think that that's emerging as a tool that's domain agnostic, that uh, researchers are using across different fields. So for graduate students, I think that's that would be a very worthwhile use of your time to learn R, um, is it's portable outside of whatever specific field you're in right now. I want to plug uh, Gian's talk here. I, I actually think that her uh, suggestions are exactly the answer to your question, which is, uh, if you sit down with the people who you work with the most and make a mindful decision about the kind of workflow that you want to uh, systematize at the level of a lab or at the level of a community, you have a much better chance of sticking with it and uh, creating a system that will have some persistence than if you uh, jump out into the void and start using all of the newest tools and uh, get tired and alienate the people you collaborate with. So. Um, I think you know that uh, that consensus is going to differ from lab to lab and community to community. Ideally, the best systems to uh, find consensus around are those that are free, uh, open, um, and relatively transparent to outsiders. And and uh, in some cases, we have really good solutions for those uh, uh, for those problems. In others, it's a little trickier. Um, version control is a tough conceptual leap for a lot of people. Um, so uh, getting sent a GitHub link. Uh, in my experience, is not always the friendliest way to share. Um, 
On, on the other hand, um, I, I do think that literate programming, um, so uh, the uh, R Markdown in our studio uh, and the IPython ecosystem, these both really, I think, change the accessibility of code and the intersection of code data and reproducibility for uh, collaborators. Being able to read a document and see it formatted is very different than getting this teletype file, you know, 500 lines long. It says, oh, here's everything I did. Just review it, if you will. So. Um, so finding those communities and finding a set of, of easy tools, I think those are the two ways that I move forward on this and doing it locally is exactly the right direction. Yeah, I'll just add to that. Yeah, I think um, in psychology, I've sort of the poster child for social science because I have degrees in three different social sciences, but in psychology it's easy because we have labs so we can sort of get together and weekly and read these papers and you know discuss exactly how we might implement them. Um, <laughs> And that's what we've done in our lab here. In other disciplines where you don't have that opportunity, maybe you need to start a journal club. Um, or in economics, you know, you have brown bags and things where maybe people can present more methodological papers um, and make it a little more accessible. Um, yeah, and a lot of these papers have tools that are very easy to implement. You know, here is the R code that I use to do a meta-analysis as part of my uh, power analysis. Um, and so we've sort of collected these different tools and share them locally, but we're still evolving our set of best practices, right? So when we find new things, we edit it. Our archive form has changed over time. Um, but what's, what's nice is that we have this system set up where it, you can bring things up. You can say, oh, I, I read this new paper and now I think Maybe we should change that, um, and that's what we've done. I guess I, I would just echo what everyone else said in terms of us choosing a domain specificity. That's because we also want to choose the tool that given domains are using. Um, there could be a, a, a potentially better solution in terms of a programming language, but if everyone in that field is using that language, to teach something that would have to shift them away from their entire field means they're not going to use it. Um, and so what we talk about kind of is good, better, best. Um, so you can't immediately get to best. You have to start at good um, and, and build up to best. Um, so using, uh, using the things that the people around you use is where you're going to gain the most traction. Um, that being said, um, open source would definitely be um, my recommendation. I think all of us are Python, um, probably the most prevalent uh, in data. Other questions? Everyone's tired. Hungry? There's one over here. Um, what you should do when replication is it is cheap, so we kind of might as well be be doing it. Um, and so I wrote down, what about when replication isn't cheap? So I also do research with infants. And it can take an entire year to collect data for one experiment if you have a couple of conditions. Or if you're doing research with other, with special populations, it can take years to gather a group of children with cochlear implants or children with fragile X or a particular group. So what do we do when we have these unreliable participants who um, are hard to collect data from, hard to just get them into the lab in the first place, and there's huge variation in the results that we see as well. Uh, so what do we do in these um, messy areas? So uh, I kind of gave the, um, the non-infancy portion of my uh, research methods portfolio to this audience, but I actually, the majority of my effort on this issue is devoted to how to deal with uh, infancy and early childhood, which are theoretically exciting, interesting topics that have potentially really deep methodological problems because of exactly the issues that you raised. I, I wrote a blog post which was somewhat facetiously titled uh, Team Up or Slow Down, uh, but I think that's actually my sort of quick summary of what I believe infancy research needs to do. Uh, we're trying to do both, uh, so one thing that I've been trying to put together is a large-scale uh, replication effort uh, inspired by many labs. It's called Many Babies. 
<laughs> You've got babies, we, we need them um, <laughs> for science. Uh, no, but uh, what we're trying to do is actually understand scientifically some of the variability that you're describing and figure out its sources, figure out best practices for how to control that variability, uh, and then move on and try to estimate some of the most theoretically important effects at scale. Uh, I'll tell you how that works in 10 or 15 years. Um, the other thing that we're trying to do, and I think this is really uh, one way forward for specific individual labs, is trying to understand uh, the expectations we should have about samples and effect variability across literatures. So we have a project called MetaLab that's all about uh, meta-analyses of infancy research, trying to sew together different meta-analyses on different phenomena or different methods so that you can gain good expectations about what power you should expect uh, and actually run power analyses on the site based on phenomena of interest and methods of interest. So you can say, hey, my, I shouldn't just always and only have 16 babies in every cell, which is actually the standard. That's how this field works, 16 babies and you're done. Um, <laughs> Me too, everybody, 16 <laughs> babies, and, and it takes a year, as Katie said. Um, uh, but you should actually thoughtfully think about, okay, what, what expectations should I have based on this relatively large prior literature? And so we're trying to create the tools that make that easier for labs to do. Other questions? That is in text analysis, and so it seems to me just I realize that the data cleaning process is uh, really where a lot of the action is. And I think that we don't talk a lot about transparency and data cleaning. I mean, have like files and files of Python scripts doing very specific things to the raw data files that someone would probably want to know, but to try to dig through that is, is really annoying probably for that person. So I just wondered if you had any thoughts about transparency and data cleaning or recording data um, in the first place. Yeah, I think that's a really important point um, in the sense that data cleaning is just as essential as the analysis. Mm -hmm. I mean, your analysis means nothing if you've excluded half your data for whatever reason. Or So you need to, I, I think we would all say, you know, transparency through the whole process is important. So when you publish your paper, you, you publish your data cleaning scripts. Um, and yeah, maybe, maybe they're messy, but someone could run them, right, and regenerate uh, what it is that you did, so there's no confusion about about what happened. And the question, you know, are things doing the things you expect? I think that's always a challenge. And, and you talked about how how confident are you in your own results, mm -hmm. right? I think that's a really good bar. Um, and so, if you feel like you kind of cobbled something together and you're not sure it really works, then and you're worried about releasing it for that reason, um, you know, can you do testing? Put in some unit testing or some print statements that are gonna give you a little bit more confidence that your data cleaning scripts are doing what you expect them to do, right? Um. I would also say a more general point is that all of these things sound kind of scary from the outset. I have all sorts of stuff in my code that even as I've tried to change my practices in anticipation of other people potentially looking at it, it's like, I'm sure this is you know inefficient. I'm sure this is you know bad in some ways and it's it's like, really anxiety inducing, but it's one of those things where I think you just have to pick a project and try it. And what I've found is that the reality of doing it is actually a lot less scary than the idea of it, right? So the, the anxiety or the anticipation of a bad outcome can stop you from trying to make a small change that could ultimately, you know, turns out to be pretty easy and, and then those habits start to change and we get better habits overall as a field. One quick note on, on dirty laundry, like data cleaning scripts. Um, my lab does a lot of pair coding. <laughs> That's the sort of uh, most local instantiation of, of, of openness in terms of code. And I think it's really nice to have somebody next to you. Um, and if they start saying, oh God, oh God, stop that, stop that, and you're like cutting and pasting <laughs> the same thing and like trying to change like three characters in each of the different statements to do like slightly different things and it's like 500 lines long and you just don't know what's happening, if their head starts to hurt, that's a good sign that you need to factor it out, figure it out, uh, work these things out. At, at a more global level, um, posting things on GitHub, for me, you know, I post some pretty cruddy code on GitHub, but it's, you know, knowing that it's out there, uh, is a brief check. I, I try to, you know, I try not to be desperately ashamed. It should at least be, you know, there should be a comment. It, there's not great comments, but there's gonna be a comment that says like at least, 
what I'm trying to do in this large function. You know, so, so it's these kinds of social checks that help me um, kind of calibrate. You know, it's not going to be brilliant software, but it's going to be, um, there's going to be some documentation. It's not going to be shameful. And I try to, you know, you try to straddle that line. Make it better. Don't make it best. Time for one more, maybe. <laughs> um, so I have a question. It's for the <coughs> Oh, thank you. Oh, okay. Well, for the AV, I'll do this. Um, so it seems like a lot of the sort of suggested approaches that you've all discussed are things that where the startup costs have been paid, the collective action problems have been solved, and now we're down the line and we see sort of these really tangible results from adopting these approaches. So my question is, uh, how do you start starting local um, in an environment where you have Obviously, you know, you need sort of grad students and faculty on board, right, to right. sort of start these practices um, in an environment where everyone is very protective of their time. Um, and I'm saying this knowing that I'm sitting next to my graduate chair and, um, and other <laughs> faculty members who share this desire to kind of like adopt some good practices within our department. So how do we, how do we start starting local? Take a data carpentry workshop. <laughs> I mean, of I wrote course, it down, I, so. I mean, of course, I'm, I'm obviously a little biased, but that, but that's why we designed it, right? Is where do you start? And and it's we have professors in in our workshops, right? We have professors, grad students, postdocs, and the professors are there usually not knowing that they're not going to be the ones writing the code, but recognizing that practices in their lab need to change and that they need to be aware of what the tools are and what's involved. Um, so it's certainly easier as a graduate student to do these things if your professor is on board. It's very challenging, actually, if they're not, um, because you do. You have to. It takes time, and you would have to spend that time that is not being valued by your advisor, which is problematic, right? Um, so maybe other people. Yeah, can speak I mean, I to think that, the challenge yeah. is convincing them that there is a problem to begin with, and um, it's hard when you are a graduate student and you don't have that authority. But I'm fortunate to have an advisor who really believes in all of this and took the initiative to do that. But I think that as a graduate student, you could push this forward. You could bring that to your advisor and say, hey, I think we should read this paper about statistical crisis in science and, and discuss these things. Um, so that's sort of what I would recommend. And I would just recommend doing something. Something is better than nothing. And starting now is, is better than, than waiting till tomorrow. About gain frames, again, taking from Jean's talk, uh, I prefer to start with the positive for methodological innovations um, as opposed to the crisis. Um, so I, my feeling in communicating about this stuff is that um, you're more likely to provoke a threat if you uh, tell people that they're doing something wrong. Uh, in fact, people have been trying to get things right for a long time, they, it, just the tools evolve. And so what I like to start with is um, the bling, the fun stuff, the, the uh, like cool visualizations, the uh, speed up to the workflow. Like my favorite, um, in terms of GitHub advocacy, just for one example, my favorite thing is to show people how uh, they and I can work on two different parts of a manuscript and then seamlessly get that merged without like, you know, destroying the world and having to, you know, do diff compare documents in Word and then throwing the entire thing out because it crashes. Like, um, <laughs> or uh, showing them like reference management and how like they could actually change the formatting of a paper faster and when it gets rejected it comes back quicker or they can post a link to their, um, uh, their, you know, beautifully rendered markdown and, you know, publish that for the community to look at or for a collaborator to look at and it looks so awesome and is well typeset. You know, it's, it's those kinds of benefits that I lead with because I think, you know, the reason why I master a technology is not, usually not because I fear the bad, but because I want to aspire to the good. I want something exciting and cool and, you know, awesome looking on the internet. That's my pitch anyway. <laughs> Right, I mean, that's, we, we build our workshops, and we, reproducibility is baked into our workshops, but we bill it as be more effective, right? It's not a, we're not trying to sell you open science or to sell you reproducibility. We're trying to sell you effective. You literally can't do anything with your 60,000 rows right now that you're not gonna mess up in a, in a spreadsheet, or, or you can't even manage in a spreadsheet. So it's the effective, I need this to do my work, not, I should do this because there's a reproducibility crisis, yeah. I think that's it, um, if we can thank our panelists.